Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And welcome to the latest edition of Wildlife Chronicles, a series of online webinars hosted by the Center for Wildlife Studies. I'm Nitya Satish. I'm program manager here at CWS. And I will be your moderator for today's talk. Um, let me begin by giving you a slight overview of our organization. The Center for Wildlife Studies is an internationally recognized center, for, center of excellence in the arenas of wildlife research, in situ conservation, policy, and education. Uh, uh, we've regularly hosted these talks at our Bangalore office. These talks were conducted by leading experts in a range of topics from elephants to tigers to bioacoustics to uh, public health and safety. Due to the pandemic, we've decided to take the talks online and we launched this webinar series called Wildlife Chronicles. All of our previous talks are recorded on YouTube, uh, uploaded there, so please do check out our YouTube channel. This particular webinar will also be recorded and uploaded on YouTube in case you want to take a look at it later. If you wish to support our work, please use this QR code to donate. If you wish to learn more about our work, please visit cwsindia.org, our website, or you could also reach out to us at outreach at cwsindia.org. Uh, with that, let me jump right into today's talk. We have a very exciting webinar lined up for you and a very exciting host of panelists. I'll begin by giving you all a small brief introduction on each of the panelists, and then I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, I'd also like to request all of the panelists to turn their cameras on. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Saloni Bhatia currently works as Program Associate Human Dimensions at the Wildlife Conservation Society. Her research focuses on understanding the dynamics of human carnivore interactions, specifically how humans relate to carnivores in human dominated areas. Her work encompasses research, conservation, and policy, and she has extensive experience in social research and project management. She's also designed and taught courses on human wildlife relationships, conservation, social science, and illegal wildlife trade for undergraduate students and practitioners. Welcome, Saloni. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, our next speaker, Dr. Matthew Turner, is a professor at the Geography Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research focuses broadly on nature-society relations in dry land West Africa. His expertise includes political ecology, development theory, politics of ecology and conservation science, among others. His work involves mixed methods combining quantitative and qualitative data and analysis in novel ways. He has a very strong commitment to the communities with whom he works and directly engages with environmental science and development practices that shape their lives and livelihoods. Thank you, Dr. Turner, for joining us today and welcome once again. Uh, doc, I'll move on to our next speaker. Dr. Chandra Singh Negi is a professor at the MB Government Postgraduate College in Nainital. He's worked extensively in the Central Himalayan region. He's a nominated member of the Monitoring Committee constituted for the River Bhagirathi Watershed Eco-Sensitive Zone. He was the expert consultant for Kailash Sacred Landscape Conservation Initiative, and he was also awarded Honorary Wildlife Wardenship by the Department of Forest and Wildlife, Government of Uttarakhand. Welcome, Dr. Negi. Uh, thank, thank, you. You. thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, I'd like to ask you all to provide a brief introduction about your background, your work, and your academic experience. Dr. Bhatia, if we could start with you. Thanks, uh, Nitya. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back at CWS. Uh, I have briefly uh, been associated with the Center for Wildlife Studies. Um, so, well, I don't really know where to begin. Maybe I'll dive straight in. So I have a very uh, eclectic kind of a background going from uh, an undergraduate degree in English literature and then moving on to uh, sustainability sciences for my master's and then another master's in biodiversity, conservation and management, uh, which then translated into a PhD uh, with the Nature Conservation Foundation and Manipal University. Uh, then was followed by uh, a postdoc at IIT Bombay. Uh, but what I have basically tried to do uh, through the years that I've been associated with this whole field of conservation is to kind of understand how people relate uh, to the environment. It could be wildlife, it could be other 
kind of inanimate uh, parts of uh, nature as well and trying to really understand these uh, links and the nuances of uh, these relationships. Uh, a lot of my work has focused on uh, understanding interactions between people and snow leopards and wolves in the Trans Himalayan region of Ladakh. Uh, these regions are mostly over 4,000 meters, three and a half to 4,000 meters. And uh, uh, people here are largely agro-pastoral. Agro so there is uh, quite a lot of interaction between uh, these large carnivores who kind of tend to uh, predate on livestock. Uh, and people. But uh, having said that, uh, over time, I've kind of realized that uh, limiting our narrative to just economic losses is not really productive. Though it's important, but it's not productive because the relationships that people have with animals and with nature or their environment are very, very complex. And they don't necessarily view the world the way you and I would. I mean, everybody views it differently. Uh, communities that are closer to nature view it even more deeply in that sense. Uh, because they depend on it. Uh, so yeah, so my main interest is kind of trying to understand these relationships, how people navigate uncertainties, you know, how people live uh, with risks and yet uh, manage to coexist uh, with animals that can be potentially dangerous, quote unquote. So that's about me. Thank you. Thanks, Saloni. That's, uh, that's incredible experience. I can't wait to hear more about your work. Uh, Dr. Turner, if you could give us a brief introduction about yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Turner, and I'm in the, uh, as, as Nitya uh, mentioned, I'm um, in a, a professor of geography, um, and I'm what, a, what would you call a nature society or human uh, people environment uh, geographer. So we're kind of, we're interested in the relationship, just as uh, Dr. Bhatia described, we're interested in the relationship between human societies and the environment. Um, unlike the other two panelists who are experts on wildlife uh, uh, culture relations. I'm more of a generalist, uh, partly due to the fact that I work in an area where um, that are highly humanized, rural areas that are highly humanized in the West African Sahelian region. So this is the area lying south of the Sahara Desert. So I work with <coughs> agro-pastoral communities. Uh, this is a dry land area. Uh, much of the wildlife um, has been uh, decimated, wildlife populations have been decimated um, starting in the early colonial period. Um, I, I won't get into that story, but um, um, there are still remnant populations of large, um, both carnivores and um, uh, wild ungulates um, still in the, in the region. And uh, I have done some work um, adjoining uh, national parks where uh, many of these remnant uh, populations um, uh, uh, highly depend in terms of habitat. So um, I guess I'll, 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 I'll stop there. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Can't wait to hear more about your work as well. Uh, Dr. Negi, if you could give us a brief introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Nitya, for giving me this opportunity. As far as my work is concerned, it all started when I was in JNU and I was given this task of working in one of the forests, which was well preserved from traditional point of view. And while working on earthworm population dynamics in that forest, I repeatedly came to know about the taboo system, which actually is so effective as far as the conservation of the whole ecosystem is concerned and not just wildlife. Uh, and um, uh, after completion of that, obviously, because uh, I was from a zoology background, uh, things were rather difficult for actually continuing with the work that mostly related with kind of botany rather than uh, zoology, basically. So uh, this work on, uh, as far as the sector growth or sector natural sites are concerned, uh, it continued intermittently because it was my own interest and rather uh, because I'm fond of uh, uh, trekking through the Himalaya. So it was uh, gratifying for me to actually learn how the culture relates to the conservation aspects. Uh, lately for last, uh, I won't say lately, but last for last around uh, more than 15 years, I have been now working on the conservation aspects of caterpillar mushroom. You must have heard about this, which is called Yasa Gunbu. Uh, 
uh, that actually sells for more than 12 lakhs per kg. Uh, so I have been working on the ecological aspect, habitat ecology, and uh, what is the effect of grazing pressure on the yield of uh, Yasabungu, the cattle pressure mushroom, apart from the trade and other aspects. Uh, and as far as my work on the sacred uh, uh, aspect is concerned, uh, this work in terms of published papers, and uh, I have actually brought about one uh, reference text on the sacred Uttarakhand as such. It was pivotal uh, as far as because the uh, area which I actually intensively covered, that is our sport conservation landscape, is it, this is being proposed as a uh, UNESCO cultural heritage site. And there, one of the experts, uh, UN representative, basically, uh, Edwin Bobon, he actually uh, cited uh, my work on the, uh, this traditional knowledge-based systems as far as the land history was concerned. And it is now in the final stages of being get, getting declared as the UNESCO cultural heritage site. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have such incredible I'll jump right into the person. Positions of buildings and culture, are they inter interconnected? And if they are, how do you think they're interconnected? Uh, Dr. Turner, if we could start with you. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so uh, wilderness uh, for an academic like myself is a very um, difficult term. Um, it suggests a pristine nature and uh, we definitely live in the Anthropocene. So human society has had significant impacts on uh, most all ecosystems in the world. Um, and so therefore, um, um, we should think about kind of a gradation of human influence on, on, on natural systems um, um, and, and recognize that. Uh, social scientists and human um, humanities scholars have kind of pointed to some of the problems with the term wilderness. Um, it, it, it sets up a binary between kind of human society and humanized landscapes on one hand and and pristine nature or wilderness on the other hand. And, and uh, there's been a lot of work, for example, in the United States to show how it has influenced kind of conservation attention, uh, less attention on uh, humanized landscapes that are seen as um, uh, spoiled. Um, and uh, that kind of creates, uh, creates a um, kind of a false separation between kind of human society um, 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 including culture and um, non-human nature. Um, in fact, I would say that human um, culture and nature and or wilderness um, are highly connected with culture. Um, I tend to broadly define culture as the uh, as human ways of living, feeling, um, and believing in in this world. Um, it includes um, obviously um, uh, customs, knowledge, belief, arts, morals, law, et cetera. And um, um, when you think about it in that way, non-human nature and human culture are highly intertwined. And I, I guess I'll just stop here um, and let my colleagues um, dig deeper into those relationships. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Dr. Bhatia, uh, what would your answer be? Yeah, in fact, I completely agree with uh, Matthew because um, I think the word wilderness uh, gives us the impression that there is somewhere out there this pristine landscape which is untouched by humans, which itself is a false uh, argument to begin with, false idea to begin with. In fact, uh, we all know that even the Amazonian rainforests, which are considered to be pristine and wilder, have been domesticated and used by humans for several thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. So they are also, in that sense, cultural landscapes and not just, you know, wild uh, landscapes. Uh, but more importantly, also, I feel that uh, perhaps the dichotomy between humans and nature is kind of uh, false or even arbitrary. And I'm not sure if that really helps us 
uh, in the long run because you know the way i tend to look at it and many academics do is humans are essentially part of nature and to create this kind of a, um, a false kind of distinction that humans are somehow uh, separated from nature is a problematic ideology to begin with because then anything touched by humans like matthew correctly said becomes like a spoiled kind of a landscape and uh, yeah so i feel uh, they are deeply interconnected and uh, you know in fact there is no uh, it's very hard to distinguish between what is a cultural landscape and what is wilderness quote and so that's going to be my response thank you saloni uh, dr negi do you agree with dr sterner and batia or do you have a different uh, answer i have uh, i have uh, certain differences basically the concept of this uh, wilderness is basically a western concept it all started when uh, when the first national park actually came into being the yellowstone national park and the whole idea was that if you want to conserve wildlife the only way is to remove the human beings from that area and then the wildlife will actually recuperate that was that thing and this whole concept of protected area as defined by this uh, yellow national park Uh, was actually replicated throughout the developing country or on the developed world but it has been a failure basically as far as i know uh failure in the sense because in uh, developing country like our uh, the human being is actually part and parcel of the nature itself uh, there is throughout the world even if you call about amazon and all the forests no forest has been untouched by the human in fact the human being has actually brought about modifications and um in fact there are certain cities where the influence of the human being has actually brought about an increase in diversity of the wildlife not just the fauna but also in terms of the plants basically in terms of when you uh, create the ecotonal effects and all those things but as far as the culture is concerned i will try to re- uh, relate this wilderness with the uh, uh, sacred natural sites i was given this task of actually selecting out of more than 280 sacred natural sites that actually i studied i was given a task by a state biodiversity board to actually select 12 sites uh, six of the sites were in the uh, reserve uh, forest area and outside the reserve six other sites and the only premise was that uh, apart from all the basic criteria that actually defines the uh, sacred natural sites or uh, what they actually wanted to actually create something called biodiversity heritage sites the all the criteria were actually falsified simply because they wanted their selected set natural sites to be uh, on the road road head and the concept of this wilderness and the, how the culture or the so called uh, in ecological terms we define it as a closed system certain natural sites or those sites which are mostly preserved and highly conserved are those sites which are remotely located not from the road side but they are far away from the road side they, they are inaccessible and there is a complete dependency of the locals on the forest and that dependency gets diluted when you actually create a kind of uh, communication links whether they are roads or any other infrastructure that you build up and that closed system once that was a closed system becomes opened up and once that system opens up the reliance on the uh, uh, sacred forest uh, obviously becomes much more direct because the people can now rely on the outside sources for their sustenance but as far as the culture and this uh, wilderness is concerned obviously i can relate the same thing when culture in the sense where where do you actually find the culture basically culture in the sense where these are these uh the second natural site obviously will be uh in those sites which are remotely located uh, in the wilderness in the sense uh, uh the forest the rocks the anything uh which is basically a resident site of the deities uh, so obviously you will find the as far as the conservation ethics are concerned as far as the traditional norms are concerned as far as the taboos are concerned there will be much more impact on those remote sites and not and that obviously gets diluted and that you won't find that concept of or the institution of the sacred being practiced on those sites which are now 
uh, linked with the roads or any other communication means. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Nidhi. Uh, the concept of sacred sites is a very fascinating topic, and I will ask you a few more questions later on okay. in the webinar. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, moving on, you all work in very different landscapes with very diverse communities, right? And all of them follow different cultures. What, according to you, is the the role of culture for wildlife conservation? It's slightly similar to the previous question, but um, uh, what, according to you, is the significance or role of culture for wildlife conservation specifically? Uh, Doctor, sorry. Okay. Who do you want to go the first? Is who? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doctor Bhatti, if you could go first. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, culture is like this umbrella term, right? And it includes so many different aspects. And I really love the definition that Matthew gave, that it's a way of believing and living. It's, it's essentially uh, a lived experience. Um, so uh, just to kind of, uh, just for clarification, say, when we say culture, it could mean very different things to different people. And to think of culture as this monolithic entity that can somehow be connected to conservation uh, and studied under a microscope is 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 to be re-examined in some senses because you know uh, uh, we we no matter how hard we try to wrap our heads around what uh, a society's culture is it can be so subjective and so different because it's at the end of the day something very personal at one level and. Uh, you know, also at the level of the community. So there, uh, well, there are several kind of studies uh, as part of my PhD, some of them that I examined where, you know, there are, uh, how, how do you say, there are a lot of cultural norms um, and taboos. Uh, there are a lot of cultural practices that uh, go hand in hand with conservation. Uh, so there's this one study which looks at religion and looks at how Buddhist monks are patrolling snow leopard habitats um, and contributing to uh, you know the mon monitoring of their populations. Uh, they also have norms and taboos about you know different aspects of conservation. Now, uh, uh, but having said that, there are also going to be examples where the two are not in sync from a conservation perspective. Um, so uh, while it's very closely linked, uh, to just look at it from a very positivist sense that, okay, this is how culture can benefit conservation or this is how it doesn't benefit conservation is kind of reducing the complexity a little bit. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks, Saloni. Uh, Dr. Negi, what would your answer be? Uh, I, again, you cite some examples from my studies, basically in the Ascot Convention Landscape. I encountered a number of sacred alpine pastures, uh, alpine meadows, which were actually uh, regularized in terms of that only yaks and its hybrid called jupu and jomo, they were actually allowed to graze. And other livestock like sheep and goats, they are completely prohibited from entering into that landscape. And this is a very important when you actually see that the, uh, the whole lifestyle of these inhabitants are actually around uh, the rearing of the livestock. And there are the local, uh, which are actually called unwalls in the local parlance, and the uh, uh, actual shepherds. They have this uh, huge flock of uh, sheep and goats uh, around on an average 400 to 500. And they are simply disallowed to actually enter. And uh, not in the sense disallowed, but they actually uh, carry on uh, the kind of provision and stick to that, those provisions. And when I actually studied the biodiversity of that alpine pasture, for example, there is one called Lapalchu, uh, located at a height of 3,800 meters or so. When I actually studied the biodiversity, floral biodiversity, I actually encountered more than 70 species of medicinal and aromatic plants, not just the whole flora. I'm just including those aromatic plants. So this uh, medicinal herbs are being protected simply because of the uh, by prohibiting the larger uh, livestock from actually entering to that uh, sacred pasture because the number of the yaks is very limited. Hardly you can count uh, less than 10 and similar these hybrids also. So this is one way of actually conserving uh, the wildlife when you talk about the medicinal herbs. 
Then there is another example I want to cite. In the whole landscape itself, uh, there is one particular wild hair type of animal which is called Himalayan marmot. The uh, scientific name is uh, marmot bobak. And this animal is treated as a totem species. Totem species are those species which are somehow related with that uh, community or the village. Uh, it's kind of uh, a relationship where uh, it's species, uh, because of its quality, normally those species are uh, not of economic uh, use uh, for the villagers, uh, but they are ferocious or carnivorous kind. And uh, they must be having some characteristic which, with which the locals actually associate their lineage. And thereby they actually conserve it. The killing is a table, basically. And this, uh, I encountered one example where any, any of the calamity or the natural calamity actually takes place in that landscape. The people actually run to the ITPP post into uh, Tibetan border police, uh, the uh, campsite, and they inquire whether you have actually killed that animal or not. Because associate any calamity with the killing of that animal. And that's, you can just understand how well conserved all this, uh, this whole state of norm is. So you find a lot of examples. There is one example from the Rudhapriya district. Uh, there is a forest, Hariali forest, where there is an institution called Mirigoli. Mirig means deer. And uh, whenever the hunters actually enter into the forest to kill wild, and if they encounter any deer with a white mark on their head, forehead. They just come back. They are kill from the flock. And they treat that animal as an ancestor. So it's very common. It's a trans factor that one of the animal might be having a white mark on the forehead. So there are a lot of examples where the cultural norms actually conserves the wildlife. In fact, there are the most common kind of uh, conservation is that whenever the hunter actually pursues an animal to kill it, and the animal actually enters into the sacred forest and the hunting actually stops there because that is now being protected by the uh, resident deity of the forest. Any hunting will actually incur the wrath of the deity. And that's one of the best examples where the sacred sites actually conserve. Uh, it's not just the ecosystem services being provided by the uh, sacred forest, but there are other aspects in terms of wildlife conservation. I'll stop it. Thank you so much. Though the uh, examples are uh, very interesting, very fascinating to learn um, and hear about these examples. Uh, Dr. Turner, uh, as an addition to that question, I'd also like to ask you, you work extensively with pastoral communities in Africa, right? Um, how has their culture changed over the years? Um, and how has that affected environmental conservation? Okay, yeah, um, so I, I I, I just want to add um, to the um, other the other panelists um, and agree that you know culture is a very complex um, term um, and it's difficult to talk about it in a kind of an umbrella uh, type of fashion. But you know certainly as a I would say as as a uh, putting my political ecologist hat on in this era of uh, global capitalism and commodification of nature, um, when we think about what culture includes, it includes a, a, a wide range of human, human, humans, human beliefs and institutions that are not driven solely by our material wants and desires. And, and because of that, I think it is a key arena for conservation because it, it, is, it, is, at the, it is at the center of where um, human societies value non-human nature um, outside of what non-human nature can serve us in terms of material wants and uh, needs, okay? Um, whoa, how has culture changed in West Africa? That is, <laughs> well, culture is always changing. Uh, um, if I had to, <laughs> If I had to pick one, you know, it depends on what kind of temporal depth you're looking into, you know, like, are we talking about over the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever. Um, I guess I'd have to pick one, one change that I think, um, it, certainly in rural societies in West Africa that have 
has a significant conservation implication would be increased individualization within um, rural societies. And this is driven not simply by um, increased um, kind of globalization and cap, you know, um, uh, uh, growth of capitalism in these areas, but also um, just the people's lived experience. Increasingly people are, and I think it's true in the Himalaya as well, um, increased reliance, for example, on mig uh, migrant labor. Um, and, and, and basically families are kind of being, families and communities are being kind of split apart due to the material requirements of livelihoods. And I think, um, I think that has implications, right? Um, when you think about conservation, conservation in a general sense is, is a public good. Um, um, and um, um, a, a reduced cohesiveness of uh, rural communities has implications for conservation. And I'll just end it there. Um, <laughs> because there's, you know, we could, we could, I think we could talk uh, for the whole day in terms of this talking about cultural changes in the areas that we work, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Um, all of you have spoken a lot about cultural beliefs. Um, my next question is, what is animism or animistic belief? Is it the same? And uh, can all communities that follow animism be called conservationists? Um, Dr. Negi, if you'd like to go first. Uh, animism is basically a belief that uh, there is a soul uh, that exists in every uh, kind of, uh, whether it's uh, animate life form or inanimate life form. Uh, and uh, most of the time, this can be related with a kind of ancestral worship vis-a-vis uh, -vis sacred natural site that I've actually encountered. Uh, a rock can be uh, a deity. Uh, a rock can have a soul. Uh, a giant tree will have a soul. So every uh, part of the surrounding ecosystem that uh, is around the village uh, has uh, a kind of energy, so, so to say. And that energy, if uh, is uh, somehow, in a sense, uh, is, uh, denigrated a kind of thing that the uh, that soul or the, the energy will actually cause damage to the local inhabitants. And this kind of pure factor actually preserves the uh, whole uh, forest ecosystem as such. But there are a lot of examples, again, I'll you know, relate. Uh, there was one uh, massive uh, landslide in one of the villages, remote villages, uh, called Kirijimiya in Pithoragar district. And the people actually related that incident when, where a number of people actually also died. So the people actually related the incidents as a wrath of the deity because uh, one of the ladies has actually entered into that sacrosanct area where they were actually prohibited from entry. And uh, probably the lady was in the menses. And menses becomes one of the most stringent taboos uh, which actually governs the kind of infringement or kind of uh, uh, routine day-to-day uh, -day kind of activity that actually the villagers actually it's very important to relate the sacred natural side of the sacred forest. Uh, it's, uh, there are obviously a number of norms that actually governs the kind of uh, utilization from the sacred forest, uh, uh, including in terms of taboos, I could recall, there are, uh, uh, as far as the books is concerned, he has actually categorized around four to five different kinds of taboos. One is segment taboo, uh, segment uh, restricting one segment of the uh, village uh, villagers from actually entering or infringing into the forest. It may be the lower caste or even the ladies during the menstrual period for a, a week. So there is method table where actually provides certain methods of utilization of the forest resources. Uh, there is a temporal table where there is a time factor uh, when the forest is actually open up for the resource utilization. Then there is a life history table uh, in which a particular uh, stage of the life where the animals are not hunted or not killed. Then there is uh, species specific where the species or the animals as well as the plants are actually treated as sacred. Then obviously there are habitat tables where sacred natural site becomes one of the habitat tables. So animism or animistic belief uh, uh, 
obviously uh, is uh, intake on those lizards again where the, the site is actually remotely located. Uh, and this obviously leads to the conservation of the resources. The fear factor actually governs the use of the forest. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, forest uh, uh, is not exploited by the locals, but it's a regularized process. It's very important when you uh, cite the example of uh, uh, Hardin's concept of uh, this uh, uh, what common property resources. And uh, they are liable to be overexploited because the property doesn't belong to a particular individual, but it belongs to a place. And this kind of common properties are uh, tend amount to be overexploited. But as far as the secular natural sites are concerned, there are local mechanisms where the exploitation of the forest is actually a regularized process. And this regularization of the process is vis-a-vis -vis religion. And that religion again relates to the animistic beliefs of the local people. And it's totally Thank you, Dr. Negi. Uh, Dr. Bakya Saloni, uh, if you'd like to add to that. Yes, uh, I guess the definition has already been covered. So there's no point going over that. But uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, animistic cultures uh, have a closer link to nature. And like uh, Dr. Negi said, you know, it's the they attribute uh, agency and intentionality and things like that to both animate and inanimate uh, beings, uh, so to speak. Now, for example, in a place where I worked in Ladakh, mm -hmm. there are these structures called uh, lathos, which are basically, uh, you know, made of bricks. They're kind of uh, rectangular uh, in some sense. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, religious scripture that goes in. But uh, th uh, these structures have their origin in uh, Bon, which was the original religion that was practiced in Ladakh, uh, which was then taken, I mean, people then converted to Buddhism and later Islam. But uh, Bon is also essentially an animistic religion. And um, uh, there is also a history of hunting, game species hunting in these regions. So what used to happen earlier when it was legal to kill uh, game species was people would, uh, you know, uh, offer the biggest uh, horns to the deities to appease, uh, you know, the deity. So it could be a deity at the level of the village or the clan or the family. You know, there are different kinds of deities. Uh, and uh, there's also like this widespread belief, uh, which is based on fear, like Ms. Negi said that, you know, uh, if you do something uh, that is, uh, you know, contrary to what the deity expects of you, uh, then there will be consequences and uh, not very good consequences. In fact, um, uh, I mean, a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot of wild animals are considered to be vehicles of deities, even in places like Ladakh, which are no longer fully animistic, but they still retain shades of animism where so uh, the the year where there was a major flood in Ladakh uh, it was believed that uh, the ibex had actually signaled uh, this because they had come down from the pastures so the deity was kind of signaling to them that there is uh, going to be a natural disaster soon and this was basically because people hadn't followed uh, certain social norms and protocols uh, so uh, so yes the, but then again I wouldn't go so far as to say that animism equals conservation. Again, what do you mean by conservation? That the word itself is highly debated. Do you mean sustainable use? Do you mean conservation in the sense that there will be no kind of extraction? Uh, do you mean some sort of a give and take? Because we are talking here about beings with agency and intentionality. So there is going to be some kind of an interaction between the various uh, you know worlds, uh, the spiritual world, the human world, uh, you know, all of that so uh, so there are various aspects to consider you know and yeah. also to also define what you mean by conservation when you say you know. but yes surely they do have a principle of conservation ingrained in them simply by the virtue of the fact that uh, a lot of uh, they depend a lot on nature for guidance and uh, look up to it so yeah thanks Saloni. very interesting uh, Dr. Turner, would you like to add to the last question? Yeah, sure. I, I, I don't have as many uh, rich, uh, fascinating examples coming from my area because my area has very much been affected. Um, the, it, it was a rich spiritual landscape 
Um, but world religions, particularly Islam and Christianity, is very, very much over, you know, over many decades have kind of eroded. Um, there still are remnants, like um, uh, Dr. Bhatia describes for Ladakh, but um, um, so I, I'm not going to come up with examples, but I do feel like, yes, the intention of conservation and the intention um, is quite different than um, animism. But um, when we think about animism as, 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 as ways in which to uh, seek um, and maintain spiritual balance, there, there, is a, there is an analogy to conservation. And, and I, would, I would just urge people that are involved in conservation, um, we tend to think about conservation as a science, right? But what is motivating you, right? What is motivating you to do this important work? And there's a spiritual side, there's an ethical side to that. And I think there is, there is some kind of connections between the underlying motivations for scientists to get involved in environmental conservation um, and, um, uh, and kind of the spirituality that is, in, that is embedded within animism. In fact, I would say that there are increasingly now um, environmental uh, philosophers, Western philosophers, are increasingly embracing kind of animism, animistic ideas. Um, it's now called kind of animist philosophy right now in environmental philosophy. So it's really an interesting area of like giving kind of not the, the idea of giving non-human, it's, it's connected to the idea of giving non-human um, life um, rights um, um, within kind of human, human philosophy and ethics which has always been human-centered. I'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Turner. A point you raised is actually a great segue for my next question. You spoke about ethics. So my question to you all is, how do we as researchers or conservationists or even tourists be mindful of local culture? And how, do we, how can we educate ourselves to be mindful of the landscape that we choose to work in? Uh, Saloni, if you could go first. Yes, uh, well, there are plenty of things to do, uh, but I think the, the, the foundation for everything is humility and uh, a healthy curiosity, but not an intrusive one, I'd say, uh, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, there is, you know, the world is our oyster. There's so much available on the internet. So if one is really interested in educating oneself, there is plenty of literature out there, both in, on, online as well as in print. You know, there are, there's a lot of audiovisual formats that you can look at where, you know, wherever you're going to a place, kind of do a bit of background research, uh, you know, kind of uh, also be open, I would say, because a lot of times we go uh, to a place with, uh, you know, and look at it from the ethics that have been ingrained in us, you know, and we've been raised in a certain way to look at the world in a certain way and we think that is the right way. And a lot of times we end up judging instead of learning from cultures. Uh, so I think uh, whether it be uh, as tourists or conservationists or researchers, I think there's a lot of unlearning to do and relearning as well. So that is something that I have come to uh, kind of realize uh, through my research. Thanks, Saloni. Uh, Dr. Negi, would you like to add to that? Uh, I'll just, uh, Dr. Saloni has actually a bat here. Uh, she has actually elaborated quite uh, very nicely as far as unlearning kind of uh, that aspect of. Uh, I'll give an example uh, when you actually carry out a kind of uh, field work or research in some remote area or the landscape. Uh, obviously, one actually turns out for 10 days or 15 days more than, not, not more than 20 days, and then uh, carries along a questionnaire. And because you know, only uh, on the basis of the questionnaire, tries to elicit the kind of information. But he doesn't stay at that particular area for a longer period of time. Just to cite an example of Ariel Alvin, uh, one of the leading anthropologists of India. Uh, he was actually a uh, missionary uh, who actually uh, was actually sent to India. Uh, and uh, one of the roles of the missionary, obviously, is to preach the religion, the Christianity. While working amongst the Gond tribes of uh, Central India, he became so enchanted with the lifestyle of those people. In fact, he married one of the ladies there. 
stayed in that place and he started writing about the culture and all that aspect and became one of the leading rather he was he was supposed to be the uh, first director of the anthropological survey of india but simply because he didn't have a background in anthropology uh, he was not met the director or rather deputy director uh, kind of thing uh, so it's very important when you actually venture into the landscape and you 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 need to have uh, that kind of down to earth approach uh, you cannot be kind of uh, uh, pretend yourself being more knowledgeable than the locals because the culture basically is adaptive in nature whatever practices the locals are actually carrying out is adaptive in nature that whole environment actually the, uh, for example if someone is uh, is a, a non vegetarian uh, um, um, most again side by example from the scout conservation landscape the area mostly uh, as far as the summer habitations are concerned because these people actually carry transhuman kind of lifestyle so they have two different homes winter home and the summer homes summer homes are actually located at a higher altitude which is uh, uh, cold and very extreme kind of climate is there uh, the land availability as far as the agriculture is concerned uh, is very meager not even 0.2% you can just imagine is uh, cultivable land so more reliance on the livestock uh, livestock population is there so uh, as food item they normally eat meat basically if someone from outside uh, actually preaches them about the uh, uh, about the kind of vegetarian or the how ecologically beneficial the vegetarian lifestyle would be uh, it doesn't uh, relate to the kind of lifestyle so one has to pass a relatively longer period of time with these people to actually learn about the kind of lifestyle and the truth or the reality uh, that actually will uh, that only will enhance the actual knowledge of the uh, inquisitor which normally doesn't take place because the time is spent in these landscapes or the, or the cultural landscape i would say is very meager uh, i will stop at that very elaborate this kind of aspect on the letter questions <laughs> thank you uh, dr tono uh, i have an addition to that question for you okay of audience so holly asks uh, what are the first steps scientists from foreign countries should take in order to prevent our own cultural biases from coming into conservation studies so if you could answer both these questions okay well I, i'm going to repeat i uh, in in um on a very basic human level as dr patia said right humility right you as an outsider are coming to a place and you're coming there because there is something to conserve biodiversity right a, a landscape why is it there right um people have been living there right and it still exists right i'm coming from an urban area where it doesn't exist right so there not to overly romanticize um uh local human culture environment relations right but th they um local communities have had a role in producing that landscape that is valued from biodiversity or conservation perspectives right and so it's very important to um you know to be humble right that you need to learn from from the, these people in this area. And in addition, I would argue that you need to address, you need to acknowledge that um, these communities are not homogeneous, that within, within let's, let's say a village, right? There'll be a diversity of levels of knowledge about the environment, as well as different values placed on that environment, right? And it's important not to see, right? everybody is a threat to to conservation right um there is a diversity there's a there's shades of kind of engagement for example with well we have an expert we have a couple experts on human car carnivore relations right but um there's a different kind of shades of kind of feelings and and experiences uh, of 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 those relationships and as outsiders you need to be attentive to that because um understanding that diversity i feel is a really important 
uh, one of the important uh, factors affecting the relative success of, of a conservation approach, uh, at least a community-based conservation approach. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Um, so one of my next questions to you, uh, you already touched a little bit about the landscape, on the landscape you worked in and about your research, but um, as part of your work, you've looked into folklore, myths, fables, etc., to understand the relationship between communities and wildlife, right? Uh, that's super fascinating. So could you speak a little bit more about that and tell us what you found through your research? Yeah, uh, I'll try to uh, paraphrase uh, what I learned. But uh, basically what I did was, uh, what we did was we looked at, I mean, we collected a lot of folklore. I think I have managed to analyze only 10% of what I collected. Uh, but from what we did analyze, we looked at three species, which was the snow leopard and the wolf, because that was kind of the primary species I was studying for my PhD. And also, uh, you know, people's relationship with the ibex, which is the main kind of game species there. There are a couple others as well. And this is in Ladakh. And, um, you know, uh, basically I started out by kind of just documenting different stories. Uh, you know, it could be anything from a one-liner saying to a belief to, uh, you know, an actual proper myth. Uh, it could be an anecdote, an experience that the person has had uh, with these animals. And we kind of found a wide range uh, of values that people attribute to these three animals. And, uh, you know, certain values stood out for species like the wolf because there was a lot of negative association in uh, and cultural biases against the wolf, uh, which was not really the case for the snow leopard. Uh, people looked at the snow leopard through a very utilitarian kind of a perspective to try to see how it benefits them. Um, how different parts benefit them, also the overall benefit of having uh, this animal in their environment. And for the IPEX, it was very, very interesting because, you know, uh, I think that's been a learning for me because I've always thought of resource extraction or hunting as contrary to conservation. I mean, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, through all the, a lot of the IPEX stories, I realized that the cultural relationship with the IPEX was so deep because you know, this species was a very important uh, species for uh, their hunting rituals. So it was a very kind of a complex relationship. There were, uh, you know, cultural aspects, there were economic aspects, there were uh, social aspects. Ibex really brought the community together because a lot of the hunts in the past used to happen as a village at the level of the village. And, you know, there are literally songs about the entire process. You have, uh, you know, uh, people, one person will uh, talk about this hunting dog, the dog that they have brought, and will talk about how the dog is going to follow the scent of the ibex. And the other one, while the other one, you know, makes the pava and the thukpa, which is their, uh, you know, their food uh, uh, that they eat usually on uh, treks. So, uh, so you know, it, it really describes so many cultural things. Uh, just this whole ritual of hunting. And again, like I said, there are associations between hunting and deities. So it was a very complex, uh, non-linear, circular kind of a relationship. Uh, when I started out, I, I and to kind of fit it into a kind of a quantifiable, measurable framework was really difficult. So it, I, I think for a year, I didn't look at that data because I was so overwhelmed by what I found and I wanted every I wanted to include everything in my thesis, you know, all the intangible learning as well. And it, it, it wasn't going anywhere. So then my supervisor had to sit me down and we had to find a way to fine tune that information and present it. Uh, I'm not 100% happy with the way it was presented because it was a histogram that looked at, you know, the different values and how frequently they're associated with different animals. It's one way to look at it. Mainly, it allows us to understand that there is actually a spectrum uh, of values, you know, going from very positive to very negative or, or, or in other terms, going from, uh, you know, uh, having negative kind of affective, uh, you know, totemic uh, relationships to uh, very reverential sacred relationships. But at the same time, it's not to say that, uh, uh, I mean, it's a very iterative kind of a relationship. So the same animal might mean different things in different contexts. My, people might associate that animal uh, with different uh, emotions. Uh, you know, in some situations, in certain contexts, uh, they may be liked, in certain contexts, they may be utilized in certain contexts, uh, you know, they may not be liked. 
Um, so the prime example I would like to just kind of end here uh, with this example is of the wolf. And there was such a wide range. So you have the wolf as a deity of uh, certain uh, Buddhist deities. You have the wolf uh, uh, and there are a lot of negative connotations of words like greed, um, hatred, uh, gluttony, you know, all these associated with the wolf. But at the same time, it is a vehicle of the deity. In certain situations, if you cite a wolf at the beginning of your journey, it's considered auspicious. So there are all these different dimensions. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I looked at. One, one part of my thesis looked at that. Very interesting. Thanks, Saloni. Um, we have a couple of questions from our audience. I'll read them out. Um, this is from Ishika. She asks, is it possible to disentangle history from culture? Should we and how do we unearth the historical context for present day culture to understand how human nature relationships have developed over time? Uh, Dr. Turner, would you like to take that one? Well, um, I, I, I guess my short response is that I don't think you can disentangle um, culture from history, right? Culture, culture is actually produced historically. And I do feel like, um, I do feel like um, understanding cultural, cultural, enviro, enviro cultural history, right? Looking at change over time, right? And, and actually looking at how cultures change over time is very insightful. Right from a even from from a conservation perspective, so I guess my short response, because I, I I know we're short on time, because uh, there's a lot there in that question. It's a wonderful question. Uh, it's one of those questions where you could go a week talking about it or two seconds. I would say no, you cannot separate uh, culture from history. Okay, thank you. Culture is embedded in history. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Negi, would you like to answer that question? Uh, it's a tricky question, though. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you relate, how do you relate history and culture? Obviously, culture has evolved with the time, as Dr. Turner at the beginning itself emphasized that culture actually evolves, it changes. Uh, I, I, it, why it changes? Obviously, because it's adaptive in nature. What was uh, beneficial at one point of time is no longer uh, feasible as for, with the changing times. So when you talk about the history, uh, I am finding it very difficult to actually answer what you understand by the term uh, history and how you are relating that term with the uh, culture. Uh, uh, there can be some aspects of uh, cultural as far as the conservation is concerned, again, I will cite the example from the what I've actually uh, carried out as far as the sacred natural sites are concerned. Obviously, uh, on uh, the, the elderly folk of the villager will all obviously relate the kind of ethics that was prevalent at uh, at their uh, when they were at an earlier age, uh, which has uh, completely been denuded uh, in, in the present generation. Is this the historical aspect uh, one might say? Because uh, as I said, that the opening of the system or opening of the closed system uh, to the outside forces, whether it's in terms of uh, modern education, whether it's in terms of the new uh, modes of communications uh, and more reliance on the outside forces. So obviously, uh, the cultural aspect actually that defines the lifestyle of the people uh, will change at a faster rate than what was earlier, uh, because the forces, outside forces are much more stronger and uh, the, uh, the cordiality or the kind of cohesiveness uh, that the villagers have uh, in the earlier times, because that was a closed system because uh, uh, they actually rely upon each other for their sustenance. That uh, kind of uh, relationship is no longer there because the mode of sustenance or the means of the sustenance uh, are, uh, more dependent on the outside, where they, are, they can rely on the outside sources. And obviously there are forces like out migration, whether it's for education, whether it's for employment, that also uh, denudes the traditional norms or practices over the period of time. 
So uh, history in terms of you know, what was there 100 years back, obviously will not be there. The cultural aspect will not be there after 100 years and it will keep on changing. Uh, this is what uh, I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Negi. Uh, Salone, would you like to add your view to that? Sorry, I was too lost listening to uh, the both of them that I didn't really uh, think about the question. But I guess, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> I, history. <laughs> history, history, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I, I agree with the both of them that history, uh, I mean, it's very hard to separate history from culture. Uh, I don't think that's even possible. So, yeah. I'll, I'll stop at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we have time for one more question, if you are okay, if the three of you are okay with it. This is a question from the audience. Um, Tamara asks, climate change or COVID-19 have been putting pressure on natural systems. How does one address issues of conserving indigenous culture or knowledge uh, with regards to these sorts of forced changes? Culture undergoes challenges that force changes that people aren't ready for. Uh, comments on this? Uh, Dr. Turner? Um, yeah, that uh, another great question. Um, so um, certainly in the region that I work in, um, this is a region where there has been significant climatic variability. It's considered um, along with, uh, I think the Himalaya is actually also mentioned as, as one of the areas of the world um, that is most kind of vulnerable to climate change. Um, despite that, um, I would say that uh, people have been dealing with climatic variability, droughts um, uh, 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 for, for a long time. So in a certain way, th their their, their kind of local knowledge is a bit, a bit more resilient than, than, um, than, um, uh, than, than, than other, you know, than certainly, uh, kind of, kind of Western forms of kind of development, um, you know, with built infrastructure, et cetera. So I'm talking about, I'm thinking about pastoralists and kind of their high mobility, um, um, what they're experiencing in terms of climate change is not a fundamental difference in kind, but a an increased variability. That I'm not I'm not saying that everything is is fine, but um, I think they have resources. And I, I actually I would say that we could learn. You know, Western culture, Western forms of agriculture can actually learn from um, these systems that actually have developed. Right, not to control nature, but to but to uh, change and adapt with nature's uh, variation. Um, one short thing: I think climate change does affect, um, and I, it, um, um, the other panelists can talk a lot of, of, about this. Um, I think, um, in terms of kind of um, animism and kind of uh, local knowledge. As things change, right? As the the biophysical world change changes, kind of how 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 relevant various kind of invocations of particular plants and animals that may no longer inhabit the landscapes that people live in because of climate change. This may have an effect on um, kind of the how younger people think of the relevance of. Um, Animist beliefs and um, um, local knowledge to their own lives, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Dr. Negi, would you like to add your view to that? I'll add on to what uh, Dr. Turner has said. He has rightly emphasized on the resilience kind of properties. Uh, I will cite one example. One of my friends, Ajay Rastogi, he actually runs an uh, NGO. And every year, he actually invites around 20 students from Colorado University. Uh, and these students actually uh, stay here in India for around one month. And during this one month of stay, he actually uh, 
divides these lot uh, to the surrounding villages. Uh, each of the family will have will be having two or one or two individual students to live with them, and he, they doesn't have to actually uh, do something special for these students because they are they have, they have come from U.S. A developed country. Uh, they will be doing their routine kind of uh, cooking and all that, and uh, these students will actually learn to actually within that one month period they actually learn that they can be alive. Uh, by having food for only 20 or uh, 40 rupees. That doesn't even account to around $1. So this is one kind of thing that the student actually learned by living with the villagers, that they can actually sustain themselves uh, in a meager kind of uh, that the so-called consumerism, which we actually relate to with the developed countries, that they consume more than 20 times than us. Uh, so that's one aspect of living. Uh, with the villagers, they actually imbibe that information. The other was that uh, we actually carry out uh, around 10 days of trek through the Himalayan, some uh, landscape. And uh, it's very interesting, these Colorado individuals, they have, must have read, read about the nature and all that, uh, conservation and all that, but they have not encountered nature as such. So when they actually trek through the Himalaya and they were, when we actually camp in uh, in the forest itself or behind the stream or in in midst of the forest itself so actually they actually learn about what what actually nature actually stands for so i will again go back to what uh, the actual question is that question basically relates to the uh, climate change and how they are we are actually going to cope up with that and it's very important that as uh, dr turner has said that the uh, the so-called these, uh, these uh, uh, villages or these uh, underdeveloped or the developing world is concerned, they rely on nature basically. When there is a scarcity of food, uh, they enter into the forest to harvest the non-timber forest products, whether it's a mushroom, whether it's medicinal herbs or any kind of edibles. Their reliance on these uh, non-timber forest products is very substantial to so to say. This needs to be explored by the uh, developed world or the scientific community because we have not explored the kind of species that can uh, give you a higher yield with the changed condition that the climate change actually is bringing about, the warmer conditions. Uh, as far as so suppose this mushroom is concerned, there are a lot of uh, edible mushrooms. In Presently, I am for last two years, I have been actually working on the mushroom itself the kind of edible mushrooms. In the one single valley, I actually encountered 20 different species of mushrooms. And these people are uh, actually harvesting a quite a lot in terms of tons. You must be, uh, tons means one thousand cases per place is a huge quantity without knowing the actual price or the actual market price of this commodity. Like Boluti species, like uh, apart from one species like Morkela, which is called locally called Gucci, this Morkel actually sells for around 14 to 16,000 uh, rupees per kg in Delhi. The similar kind of species, like which is, a, which is treated as delicacy by the outside world, like Japanese and all that, those species are also, also present. What I mean to say is that with the changing climatic conditions, some of the crops, the traditional crops, may no longer be yielding the same kind of, because of the change conditions because of the higher temperature. And in a change condition, some of the other crops or some of the traditional crops, which are uh, which are uh, drought resistant kind of species, which are, which are no longer being grown, but these villages still grow those species mainly for the fodder kind of thing, not for the their own consumption. So these species, uh, as Dr. Turner said, the local knowledge associated with these species uh, that can be exploited, that can be actually researched upon, and they can be actually selected. One of the species which has been termed as the crop for 21st century is uh, the uh, that what is called amaranth that amaranth uh, species has been treated simply because of its uh, multiple uses right from fodder to uh, fiber to actually uh, the edible parts the seeds are concerned uh, again is the nitrogen fixing this is just one of the examples of one of the species uh, which can be exploited as far as the climate change is concerned. There can be a lot of other examples vis-a-vis uh, -vis the climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Looney, would you like to add to that? Or do you agree with them? 
Yeah, uh, I do. I do remember the question. I made a mental note. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, actually, it's these are very interesting points. And you know, as climates get warmer, for example, in Spiti, uh, people are coming uh, in close quarters with bears, and they have not historically known how to live with them. Their agriculture is uh, their uh, architecture is not bear proof. Uh, so it's going to definitely bring in new challenges and it's going to require innovation in terms of adaptability, resilience and all that. Of course, they know and perhaps some of the customs in many places uh, are such that they can be carried forward and they are pretty resilient. Uh, but having said that, uh, any culture, be it indigenous or non-indigenous, although again, the term is uh, I mean, what is indigenous is again quite debated, but I am going to stop questioning the uh, semantics now for a minute. But, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, uh, have uh, been living here, but they also need help to understand what other cultures are doing and how they are adapting. So, uh, you know, because we don't live in a very isolated world anymore. Uh, you know, it is a very globalized world. Cultures are going to evolve. They are going to change. There are new values that are going to come in, some of which will benefit conservation. Some of it will benefit people. Some of it might not benefit either of them. Uh, but I think if there is space for sharing to occur between different groups of people, especially given the whole climate change, the context of climate change and resilience building and adaptation, I think there has to be a wider network uh, of people because we are all facing the same problem with different intensities and even though that means uh, you know kind of uh, making our cultures uh, diluting certain, some of our cultural values uh, it might still be worth it so. thanks Salumi. I think with that, uh, we've come to the end of this webinar. Thank you all so much. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface of this topic or heard enough about all your work. I wish this could go on endlessly, but unfortunately it can't. But once again, thank you all so much to the panelists for joining us and giving us your views and inputs and answering all of our questions. Um, to all of our audience members, uh, this will be uploaded on YouTube if you want to take a look at it later. And please tune in to our uh, upcoming webinars. We'll have uh, such webinars on many more exciting topics for you all. Thank you all so much again. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thanks nice meeting both. Nice meeting lovely. both of you. Yeah. Yes, lovely Dr. meeting. Saroni and Dr. Turner, it was nice listening to you both. Thank you very Likewise. much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye.